Hi, well, welcome to our May 2nd meeting of the AACSC. I appreciate everybody taking the time out of their busy day to be able to uh, <laughs> review, uh, look at the agenda items that we have lined out for today. Uh, Mr. Derek, you're taking care of roll call? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me do something with this. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, the first agenda item is the minutes from April 4th. Has everybody have, had a chance to review those minutes? And what is your pleasure? Make a motion we approve as submitted. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Who made the second? Thank I yeah, did. This is David, and I think there are a couple more. Okay. And who made the motion? I'm sorry, Zach. Uh, Heath. 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 Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, from uh, if you would state your name and and uh, what motion you're making, uh, that would be appreciated. So we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes as presented. Uh, any other discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, agenda item number two: U.S. DOL Office of Apprenticeship Report. Yeah, um, I know they, uh, John had accepted the invite, but never knew that he wasn't going to be able to make it here today, and he's not on. Yeah, I don't see him on. I know he's uh, he's in Little Rock now. Uh, he is doing business. I do emails from him from time to time, so he is engaged uh, into the into his job, I know, so Maybe he can join us later and uh, update us at that time. Um, agenda item number three, the OSD report and TA report. Uh, I have this up on the screen. As we had previously talked last meeting, I went ahead and included our, uh, you know, our the final stuff on the CT so we can see it. Uh, and just kind of left that statement down there that we had before and then updated our uh, TA payout as of right now. Uh, well, uh, a few days ago, we were at a payout of $1,302,429, uh, which would leave us a remaining TA balance of $501,790 uh, from our uh, $1,804,000 that we had originally uh set aside so um and just so kind of give you all a filler in on that uh if i go and take the average between all the months that have been uh that we have already basically completed at this point if i take the average from those and then basically put that into our april and may uh months uh using that average we're going to be about around 12,000 or so above our 1.611 million. So as you see, we're, we're still going to be far cry from the 1.8. So, uh, so we'll, we're good there. So like I said, that's just using an average. We'll see what comes in. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a good idea, Derek. Uh, mm -hmm. We, we, you, we should hit pretty close then. And uh, the month of May. I cannot believe it's the month of May. It's flowed by. So yeah, we're wrapping up, wrapping up schools programs are doing that, wrap, wrapping up the semester. So uh, I mean, we're at the end of the physical year. So, and um, 
I, I'll correct myself later if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure we still have three programs who have yet to submit their uh, proof of payment for our CT uh, purchases, uh, grants that had been approved. So uh, I'm gonna get back with them again at the first week, just reminding them, hey, we gotta have it in. Uh, so uh, just uh, just kind of keeping on them, uh, letting them know, letting them know, because can't pay it out until I get it. So and we can't carry it over. And these are CT requests or reimbursements that happened back in January, or yeah, they're they're all different. They're actually kind of spread out a little bit. Yeah. All right. Well. Yeah, we have deadlines on those, CT, TA. We both had deadline dates on those. So if they go past that, then, you know, if they uh, had uh, enough time to do all that. So I don't, I don't know. They just need to turn them in as soon as possible. It, it helps us um, as a committee, as OSB <coughs> balance uh these budgets and see how much money we have uh at any given time during the year i mean we just need those done as soon as we can and just helps us out so much with the numbers um uh, i'm gonna go uh i've talked been talking with of course with stephanie our director i mentioned it to the executive committee last week um what i am uh looking that i something i would like to try to accomplish is adding a uh, page on our website that would allow any uh, employer that utilizes apprenticeship to be able to post their job postings for free. Uh, they would send in their basic information. We kind of get all that figured out for sure, uh, how we look at it. And then we would have that uh, listed on our website uh, of course, we would then have um, talking with Kim and our, uh, you know, kind of our mar uh, shared services group uh, with marketing. She deals with our Facebook post and all kinds of other things that we put out there for OSD. Uh, we would then, as soon as that kind of got got going, then we would, uh, she would make mention of it uh, on there to kind of get everybody, try to inform everybody, uh, any possible people looking for jobs, et cetera. Uh, that they could go look on our website for that. Uh, of course, with our, uh, you know, still ongoing kind of transformation that we're doing here in the uh, Department of Commerce, um, we are, you know, basically going to be having, uh, uh, we got, we're going to have a business employer outreach, of course, us at OSD. Uh, we got employer workforce programs, adult education, employment service, rehabilitation services, and services for the blind are all going to be, uh, connected underneath our uh, workforce connections uh, main department. Uh, and uh, also I would try to get in touch with them so they can also use that uh, to also help try to lead people uh, to our site uh, when they have individuals that are job seekers. Uh, so uh, just kind of been thinking about that. Uh, just kind of wanted to get y'all's thoughts on on what your what what would y'all think about that as far as having that ability to have an employer, employer post their uh, apprenticeable job on our state website. Uh, just see what y'all's thoughts are. Didn't you say that it would fall off every month or so, so it would be a fresh list? Something? Yes, sir. I, I, I would like to put something in there. That way we're not just getting them put on there and then somebody looks at it two or three months down the road, they go try to talk to somebody that they're seeing has a posting all to find out that they've already hired and they're not gonna be hiring anybody else anytime soon. So I would like to put some type of threshold in there to saying, hey, you know, we're gonna, we'll have it on there for a month. After a month, we'll take it off unless you let us know to keep it on there. Uh, just to, you know, have something there because that way we don't have all these uh, prospective uh, employees going and looking at jobs and calling people when the job's not open anymore. Uh, just to try to keep that clean as we can. Um, what I would be looking at doing is, one, probably have some type of list format on our website uh, and also uh, with uh, the new uh, map 
maker I have uh, utilized. Of course, I have one right now that has all the apprenticeship programs in the state of Arkansas on it. It has all each program's job uh, locations as well. Uh, so even though, uh, you know, you might uh, have just one location and say in Jonesboro, but yet you got two or three more out there around the state. I got all those locations noted on that. Uh, got little um, uh, ways you can sort your stuff by city, by occupation, uh, you know, et cetera there. Uh, that way it kind of makes it easy. And then when you click on the little balloon, so to speak, it comes up, tells you what the name of the program is, what their occupations are, what their contact information is, the whole, you know, whole spill there. Uh, so I was thinking possibly of even doing that also with our, uh, with those job listings as well. So if somebody wanted to also just go look at the map, then they could go look at the map and just hone in on their want, their area uh, uh, that they're wanting to look at. Uh, so we've also kind of got that out there too, that I've, uh, thought about just having that, cause that's something easy. All I got to do, go to the site, upload my spreadsheet. Within two or three minutes, I got a map ready to go. Uh, so, um, and then we can just have that link posted on our site. Uh, if it ever needs to be updated, I can either update the one that is actually already there, or I just throw that one away and create another one. It doesn't cost me anything to make these guys. So, um, and then we got a whole map uh, that uh, could be utilized. So, um, just something I, I would like to do. Um, you know, I, as I've already kind of told some of y'all before, you know, anybody comes in, calls, wanting to know any, you know, looking for an electrician, looking for a plumber, uh, any type of jobs. If it's not one of our normal occupations like one of those, then I, I try, you know, send them the list of the apprentice, apprenticeship programs in the state uh, and, or, you know, and have it limited down to what they're, what type of occupation they're looking for. Uh, and then that way they can just, they got the list, they can go make any phone call they want uh, there from there and, and get and get in touch with them. Uh, so, um, but also with that, normally I've been sending, started sending these people to the apprenticeship programs uh, in their area. Uh, I'll send them the list, say, hey, here's the ones in your area, reach out to the program to see if they are hiring. Uh, so I said, they, you know, they, they know more about what their employers are needing uh, than I do. Uh, so uh, good place to try to find a job is contact that apprenticeship program as well, especially when you are wanting to be already know, have an idea of what you're looking to go for. So basically, it's pretty much free advertisements for a job opening with a contractor that is associated with a, an apprenticeship program in the state. Correct. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not just going to open this up to everybody. <laughs> so it, it, we're 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 apprenticeship here. So only only people that use apprenticeship would be able to post on this site. Yes, I think it's a great opportunity, and I I agree <laughs> with just my thought about you know updating it once a month. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, to your point, yes, we don't want to sit there and and let it sit there for months and not get updated, and come to find out they've already filled the position you know two months ago. So. Mm -hmm or six months ago or whatever, but no, I think that's a, a good opportunity for uh, them to get their, you know, information out to other people, contact information, contractors. So, mm -hmm. okay. Sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah. So, the, yes. only, the only suggestion I would make, and it sounds like you've already covered it, but uh -huh. I've manage some job boards. And one of the things that we did to address the issue that you're talking about specifically is you'll probably have some sort of required criteria for, for how you're going to post. Yes. One of those categories should be an opening and closing date. You know, that mm -hmm. if you're giving out free coffee, everybody's going to show up and drink it as long as it's there. That right. encourages them to kind of throw it up there and say, well, that's going to be there. And they don't worry about the end if one of our criteria is that they have to provide you with an opening, a, a an opening and a closing date, that allows you to be really firm with that approach. Yeah. So we're not going to have stuff just floating out there. I think that would be a good idea to okay. actually require that when yeah. they post, they need to provide you with an opening and closing date. That way you can keep your site really clean. Yeah. 
And then, like I said, if, if they just want it back, hey, just let us know and we'll we'll add it back on there. Uh, if it's going to be posted, if, it, if the opening and closing date is 60 days, that still gives you an opportunity yeah. to provide clarity to those potential applicants. Right. Derek. Yes. Yeah, I got a little comment. Um, I hire a lot of people and we do a 30 day deal window. That's what we do. Uh, but you want that person to have the ability to take their, their off of there once they got hired somewhere. Right. Uh, all they would have to do is just. Right. Right. Yeah. All they'd have to do if they ever closed it out, just kind of let them know, please let us know if you've closed this, you know, yeah. got somebody hired, close it out. Uh, so that way we could go ahead and take them off the list. Uh, you know, one of the other things I, I was wanting to do is just kind of add a statement on that web website or on that page that just says, Hey, when you, when you go to contact this program, uh, uh, or empl uh, employer, uh, let them know you found it on the OSD website. Uh, I think that would also help us kind of have an idea of, you know, is this even being beneficial? <laughs> you know, if, if, if nobody's ever using it, then it, it doesn't do any good to have it. Right. So, um, not you know. sure how your site particular would work if a statewide site would be able to utilize this. But most of the time, if, if we were to provide links through that website, mm -hmm. you could get algorithmic feedback. So, everybody that used the site used that link to go to that employer's website, you'd get automated feedback on that. And, okay. And that's 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 something that would you're right we need to be able to track it um if we can plug that in if we have the ability to provide links to that employer's uh website you could actually see how many people were using it in real time mm -hmm. you know i know um talking with mike rogers i kind of already talked with him about this as well um you know i know they are with their you know workforce initiative that they're they're looking you know they're pursuing and pushing towards you know they're they're planning on having some type of site like that as well but it it, it will encompass all types of employers not limited to just one thing it's going to be everything so i really feel like it would be a good thing for us to have a site dedicated for our apprenticeship as well uh so that way you know hey if you want to go apprenticeship you can, you can go to kind of a one-stop shop um so uh i think it would be very good i know right now uh we're working on updating all of our websites throughout mm -hmm. uh the uh the state so i know ours probably won't actually be finalized and finished up before uh the end of august but this is something i could go ahead and start right now just by having a page added and go ahead and start getting some of this going um, and then at least we can, at that point, we can kind of test the water, see how it is, uh, see if it's beneficial for everybody. And then we really know if we want to continue with it by the time we hit into August, into September and on. All right. Good comments. Uh, do we have any other comments? All right. Good information there. Do you have anything else to add to your report? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I did, um, since we last talked, I did attend the, uh, I'm pretty sure, my goodness, things start running together. Uh, I'm pretty sure I attended the Build My Future event uh, since the last time I taught y'all that Bill Rochelle and them had there in uh, uh, in Conway. Uh, it was um, it was a very good uh, very good thing they had going on there. We had, I mean, a lot, I'm sure Bill can tell us. I know we had over a thousand students come through there, uh, had all different types of employers, some that utilize apprenticeships, some that don't. Uh, I mean, it was a, a, a mixed bag, but overall the event really looked like it was, uh, very well put on. Uh, and it seemed like everybody enjoyed themselves, uh, while at the event, you know, it gave me an opportunity to, talked to quite a few students. I probably, you know, I've been giving out these little <laughs> pins here. Uh, I, I probably gave out close to 300 of them. So every time they came to my table to get a pin, uh, we had a little conversation before they left about apprenticeship and what they were thinking about doing. So uh, it definitely helped get them in front of me. Uh, I even had them come as far as, hey, I, 
talked to so-and-so over there on the other side and they said, you had these pins here. Can I get one? So uh, they were uh, a very hot item. Of course, this thing has a compass, a flashlight, a pin, a screwdriver, uh, and a little soft mouse thing on the end of it. So it, it's got all kinds of things. So it just really, really brung in the students at that point. Um, it also gave me an opportunity to talk to some of the teachers uh, that were there with those students. Um, you know, a lot of times when I'm talking to them, I'm bringing up the possibility of the Arkansas Certified Pre-Apprenticeship Program. Um, pretty much everybody I talked to was very interested in it. I've already sent out quite a bit of stuff to those uh, individuals since the uh, meeting happened or since that happened. Uh, and uh, just trying to get them in, in thinking about it, involved and, you know, basically telling them, hey, guys, y'all need that y'all need to go talk to your apprenticeship programs in your area. See if you can't get something going with them. So uh, trying to trying to help everybody out here. So uh, getting them pushing them the right direction. Sounds sounds good. Sounds like it was a great event. I don't think Bill. I don't think he's it's not on. I don't believe. Do what, sir? I don't think Bill is has made the meeting yet. I don't. See no. Him. Oh, okay. Well, sounds good. Sounds, we need those events all over the state. Uh, every month in some form or fashion to get the word out about apprenticeship, I think. All right. Uh, any other questions, comments for Derek or Derek's group? All right. Uh, looking at agenda item number four, action item, I think we listed that as an action item. I'm not sure we'll act on anything. It might be a discussion going through the guidelines. I think Derek's gonna pull up the guidelines. We're kind yeah. of going to go kind of through that uh, page by page uh, quickly and look at those guidelines. And we need to have a uh, approved, well, we're planning on approve, uh, approving our guidelines in our July meeting. So we're, we have this meeting and we have another meeting to get everything in line and everything would go smooth and we'd have a, a new document for FY25. All right, give me just a second, guys. I'm trying to email people here because uh, they lost the link or something. No problem. Come on. <clears throat> so as members, if you would get your list out, as you went through this document, if you've made notes or anything, please get that list out so we can... You can have them pretty quick uh, that we can go over once we hit that page. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. So. All right, page one, it's one of nine. Um, so we have terms, uh, section one. Um, and it, uh, the comments I have, um, as far as we list the forms and everything, Derek, are we going to list the new uh, data uh, program that you all have? And yes, I, I will probably add a, uh, that does here, let's do and do this right here. I'm just going to get me something made. <clears throat> just get us, uh, make that quite remember. I'll uh, get us a definition put in there by the time we meet the next meeting. Yeah, I uh, thought it'd be page one or top or somewhere on page two, wherever it fits the best. It would be probably under section one. Yes. I assume. Okay. Um, contact, contact hour. Uh, does anybody have anything uh, else over page one that needs to be discussed? We have revised our committee action form, or Derek has. So I think it's it's pretty close 
I think it's pretty close to usable for FY25. I don't think there'll be any major changes, I don't think. I think it's pretty well up to date. All right, moving to page two. On the top of the page, we have forms, and then we get our standards. It goes who is eligible uh, for funding. Uh, I just want to kind of bring it, make y'all aware on this December date here. Of course, you know, uh, the one I put in there in the shared folder for y'all, I just, you know, everywhere I made a little update, I, I made a change. Just bring out, you know, I'm normally it's kind of been in January, but with the way the the first is falling this year, uh, it's going to put it uh, to where that 30th is uh, basically like the Monday before the meeting. Uh, let's see, make sure. Yeah, the third, the first is a Wednesday. So uh, the 30th would be that Monday. So I'm asking at that point, any of that extra stuff we would have uh, turned in by December 30th. That would give me at least, you know, give everybody time to kind of finish up the end of the semester, plus give them time to still have it in over the weekend uh, to our office. So before our meeting uh, that Thursday. So we will go through the uh, complete document and any dates or anything that need to be slid a week or two, we'll update those. We'll update to all the FY24s and the FY25s. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything like that, we'll go ahead and update uh, to uh, AJ's comment in the chat. Uh, we will do all that throughout the document. I think there's one other date I was gonna ask about. <laughs> And I'll wait till we get to that. Yeah, I see what she's saying. Yeah. Yeah, I can add some type of a, a date up there. Uh, that That's not a problem. Not a biggie yeah. at all. As far as eligibility, I don't think any of that's changed um, besides updating the dates. So I think we're pretty good on page two, page three. Briefly we'll look over that, see if you have any, any comments for this page. Think I had. Uh, bottom of page three, we get into section section three, uh, the TA funding, and, uh, the formula, how how we determine. Uh, the instructor reimbursement, um, all that has, hasn't changed. We'll use the same thing. Uh, how many instructors are, are in that calculation? And moving down to, moving on to page four. Uh, if, if, if I could hear Kelly, uh, you guys, I made the note here. Um, you know, the Arkansas Apprenticeship Portal uh, has been out, uh, been uh, putting, getting programs connected to it since uh, January. Um, I tell you what, uh, I will go ahead. I'm going to stop my screen right now since we're talking about this, and I'm going to show you all the up-to-date list uh, that we have for that uh, so you all know where we're at. There we go. So as you see here, programs one through 27 have already attended training. Uh, the 21 through 21 are, are already, you know, got the, uh, you need, got the, you need to share your screen. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not seeing it. My bad guys. You're all right. I thought I had it there. Might make it more where you can understand what I'm talking about. Okay. There we go. So uh, the 
over here, we got one through 21 uh, has already trained and I have received the MOU and they have access and have been utilizing the Arkansas Apprenticeship Portal. 22 through 27 have been trained. I just have not received the MOU back yet. Uh, as you see there, I'm at 29 through 39, 28 through 39 there uh, is all of our funded, currently funded programs that I have left uh, to get trained. Um, at this point here, the last few weeks, guys, I've been doing basically about five a week uh, after we finally got to the point where we're happy with where we're at. Uh, so uh, I'll be uh, getting in touch with these and then trying to knock out, you know, five or so the next each each of the next week and have this uh, have everybody trained on it uh, and have viewed it uh, here before at least the middle to for sure the end of May. Uh, so. Uh, I am also, if you look up here in the top right, you see these are our non-funded programs that I deal with. Uh, the one through 10 there are electrical and plumbing programs uh, that are not currently funded through us. Uh, most of all these, I've already talked with them in the past. They don't want to have anything to do with the funding. But uh, Hill Electric uh, Mooney Electric, both of them will have the opportunity to come on next year. Uh, I'll be getting in touch with them uh, here, you know, the next month or so and seeing if they're wanting to think about getting funding going into next year is what I typically do beforehand. So we can kind of have an idea of who might not be on right at the beginning or who, but who could possibly come on uh, there in the middle. Both of them are really close around August already. So we're not going to have too much of a change there. PH, uh, well, no, maybe it's Mooney and PHCC. I'm sorry, Hill's early. Mooney and PHCC, they both came on here around uh, November, December. So it would be more towards the end of the semester before they would have the ability to uh, receive funding. Uh, I'm still going to reach out to every one of those programs and see uh, and give them the option of being able at this point in time uh, give them the option of being able to utilize the Arkansas Apprenticeship Portal for their, uh, you know, keeping us informed of everything. So I'll reach out to them as well uh, and just see if they want to uh, give them the option. Uh, I feel like some of them probably will will want to use it, uh, you know, maybe if nothing else, get them trained on it, let them see it, and then, then see what their thoughts are after that. Uh, so uh, this is uh you know pretty much where we're at now uh so um you know been came a long way uh made a lot of progress since january getting programs on it and everything uh so um you know one reason i just want to show you all that so you'll see where we're at uh because uh going into next physical year uh we are wanting to make that a requirement in order to receive TA or CT funding. You will be required to utilize the Arkansas Apprenticeship Portal. So we're looking at amending number six, I assume, in some form or fashion, adding, deleting, whatever we're doing, probably to number six. Are y'all seeing this? Just making sure. The yes. okay, all right. I can't. Don't show me what y'all are looking at. What y'all can see. Yes. <laughs> um. So you're talking down here at number six, Kelly. Here or uh, above. I was talking about amending number six. Okay. So we add any more numbers or paragraphs, but under 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 section three, number six. Okay. We would and it pertains to reimbursement so i would assume that we would want to amend amend that paragraph to include the requirement um you think we should do that kelly or guys or y'all think it be, might be better suited under just the eligibility standards <laughs> Um, well, 
we could pro well since it's a process we probably definitely need it under three in some form or fashion to get reimbursed okay. as far as a standard eligibility standards um we might add we might add uh, a number 10 that would in, include all the information and what is required training and all that stuff okay we might be able to do that this would be a requirement that you would have to have to be in your eligibility standards And this database, what are we thinking about on uh, maximum time? It has to be updated. Uh, as far as that, it's just, you know, following our normal stuff like we've always followed. Nothing would change there. Plumbing and electrical programs have 30 days to notify OSD of any new apprentice cancellation, you know, transfer. I mean, none of that's going to change. No. Keep that, Keep that all the same way. Semester reports still only being required like they normally are at the end of semester uh, as far as either uploading the hours into the system. Uh, and uh, what I'm asking for there is you can either go in there and do them one at a time or you can just do an Excel spreadsheet and upload everybody's hours at one time. And all I'm asking for there is either way. I would like either the old semester report or if you're going to upload your hours, just give me the upload file. Send me the upload file. That way I have it in two different places here. Okay, guys, that way I got some backup going on. We got it in our system, and then I'm also going to have your separate hour uploads uh, in our semester reports files like we normally keep them. Uh, just, to, just to always have that backup. I mean, I don't, I don't think we can be too cautious there uh, just to have that with what we've already dealt with uh especially this year with yeah. programs and stuff uh, so right now the reporting at a minimum we're doing it for a semester report uh, mm -hmm. and not a monthly report correct for your uh hours yeah student hours now of course programs have the ability to use this however they want to if they want to put it in every month have at it uh if you only want to do it once a semester that's all we're going to ask for so uh, it's going to just be up to the program there to decide how they would uh, actually want to utilize it, what best suits them. Okay. Well, I think it, uh, to your point, I think it, it does need to be in Section 2, and it also does, since it is a process, it does need to be listed probably in Section 3 under, uh, in the paragraph of Number 6 mentioned again briefly or somehow and when we're updating this document uh so everybody doesn't have to bounce back and forth between two documents uh if we could strike through anything that we're mm -hmm. uh deleting and then uh, put in red what we're adding uh, that would just help me so much when i go through a document and try to uh, review stuff and the changes and approve the changes uh, I don't have to look at two different documents and try to match them up. So we went through that process with the state uh, workforce development board and it, you know, they, they said, well, we want you to approve this document and they couldn't, couldn't go line by line of what they've changed. They had to bounce back and forth. So they're getting that fixed. So anytime they update a document, you will see what they're deleting and you will see what they're adding all in one document. So Hopefully we can do the same here. And I think we've done that in the past, so help me. Okay, any other comments uh, to, um, to the database or anything and where it needs to be inserted into this document?
All right, anything else on page four? Which it ends uh, with page, training. Page, page training. four, um, as far as how we have been doing it, we've been requiring y'all to submit your payroll documentation every month. And uh, talking with Stephanie, uh, we uh, we have decided that we would be okay with only doing it twice a year. We would submit it uh, at the beginning of the year in August. Uh, I would keep that information available, and we would just go with whatever those pay rates are from that first time going forward. If any changes are needed to an instructor throughout the year, just send me that updated payroll information so I can see that we've updated his pay. We'll run through there, and then uh, in January, we'll have it submitted one more time. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then we'll go on unless, like I said, we need an update. Uh, and then we would, that I think we feel like, you know, we're still having the same thing accomplished. We're keeping at what these uh, instructors are, or what their pay is at. Uh, and that will at least take off the whole having to get the supportive documents ready every time they're ready to turn in their 236 every month. Okay, so we're asking it, or asking, or we'll be asking to, at a minimum, um, we need that, well, not a minimum, but updated twice a year. Yes, sir, and I was going to look at putting... Uh, you know, start of the fall semester and start of the spring semester. Yes. And just in case any changes between those two dates, if something occurs. Yes. Okay. And we're going to put that uh, in number seven. Uh, I figured I'll, I'll have it probably right here in number five. Uh where it says the monthly request for TA shall include supportive documentation. Well, I'll just, we'll get that, okay. you know, reduced down uh, or, okay. you know, that modified there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong thing. I was looking down here at payroll costs, but yes. Okay. Yes, makes sense. So we'll insert information about that in number five under section three. I don't okay. think anybody would have any issue with that, any of y'all, especially programs that have to do it right now. What's y'all's thoughts? Improvement. Okay. All right. Anything else on page four? Page five? Uh, program review and service training, requirements of approval for programs, electrical and plumbing. I don't think any of that's changed. Um, up here at the top in our virtual or blended approach, uh, you know, number nine section here for virtual or blended training, uh -huh. uh, we are okay with reducing the number of months the recordings are to be required to be kept from six months down to three. Uh, and then also this electronic sign-in sheet must be maintained for each class. I feel like that in the next statement, a computer diagnostic listing each participant would join lead times must be maintained. I feel like that's really, truly pretty close to the same thing. Uh, we're we're going to see when you're signing in and we're going to see when you're logging out. So I do not see no reason why we need to have a, a separate electronic sign-in sheet being maintained. Uh, so we would look at removing that and then going from six months to three months. Yeah, uh, computer diagnostic listing for each participant. Um, with the sign-in sheets that shows join times, lead times must be maintained. And yeah, you can probably just put it under... Under the same one. It's kind of how I feel about it. <laughs> it's pretty close to the same thing. Uh, so.
I, I agree with that, Derek. I mean, there's not, I mean, just in regards to if, if, we, if we were to do that with Blackboard, for example, there's really no such thing as an electronic sign-in sheet. It's it's simply a, you know, a diagnostic report. Right. Okay. So we'd be looking at striking this. That. And that. Three months. <clears throat> All right, section four under on page five, looking at that information. Do we have any changes there? All I had done here, guys, is this ABCD was noted with dots, but yet I, we had ABC, A, B, and D down here. <laughs> so I just changed it from the dots to the A, B, uh, C, D. So... Uh, and then that way it makes sense. Hey, hey, Derek, this is John. Uh, yes, sir. I, I apologize for the background noise. I got the uh, AC unit running behind me, but the... Uh, this uh, in number three there in section four, number three requirement, the 230 form, is that the transfer form that we were talking about just the other day? Well, basically, yeah, yes, uh, John, it was our, uh, you know, 230 form, just general form. And that transfer was just part of it. As you see, it's for a new apprentice cancellation reinstated. It, it does multiple right. things there for us. Yes. Okay. So I, I just wanted to chime in on that to, and for so that every, everybody else hears as well that the, the, the only issue I've seen on any of those that have come across my desk, and I know I don't have to see all of them, but um, for transfers and so forth, uh, I need to see wages on that uh, form. And I, I mean, make sure I see the, the, the version that has wages. I know those ultimately get entered in at some point when they get finalized and signed. I just need to make sure that whatever version gets sent to me, it gets sent with an exit wage from the uh, departing program and the entry wage for the gaining program. So other, otherwise, that's all I had. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you, John. And I did, uh, after we talked, I did send an email out to all of our apprenticeship programs yesterday informing them of that, you know, exit wage should be the one uh, wage coming from the, the losing program, so to speak, and the, the gaining uh, would be the uh, entrance wage. Uh, if I said that right. Um, so, uh, so hopefully uh, everybody will see the email and we can get that accomplished for you. I know he had told me that he had been seeing a lot of them come into him with nothing noted whatsoever uh, on the wage section. Well, welcome, John. I didn't even note that you were, were on, so I apologize for that. That's okay. I was just listening intently, right? Listening and learn. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, page five, experience credit. All right. I'm hearing nothing on page five, page six. Um, we get into kind of the meat of the, the items, the the uh, four sections, I believe, or somewhat four, three sections. So looking at it, our budget, um, are we going to establish it again at 800000 Is that our intent? I assume it is. Yeah, as far as us, yeah, I mean, and that's no problem here. 
is and the percentage of that 800,000 and how we break it down, uh, looking at uh, section one, uh, one through four, with the 60,000 for outreach, curriculum 640, uh, equipment 60, and instructor training 40. Are we gonna probably maybe use those same numbers to start out with? I think we start out with the same numbers. We can always modify them. I mean, I think this year was a strange year with the changeover for a lot of schools for the curriculum. So I totally agree. I, I think I look for it to level off more next year to be more spread out and not so curriculum heavy. But that, that's just my thought on it. No, I totally agree. Uh, I think you're on point. Yes, I think we'll see a more constant or consistent spending instead of heavy in curriculum so okay uh section two you know, i think that has changed anything else on page six moving down to page seven and i am well i've got derek's up or not derek's but um, I know, um, if you don't mind, Kelly, I know uh, David had sent me some possible changes on what he was thinking of with our whole code book discussion that we had last week. Yeah, um, that, that's the one I have pulled up on okay. my computer screen. Is okay. what I'm going to uh, minimize this, guys, and bring that up. If I can find there it is. Good idea. Y'all seeing uh, this? With yeah. The red line? Okay. Yeah. Before we get down to that, the uh -huh. section three on CT applications must be submitted June tenth. Uh, don't we have a different date for PA? Isn't it like June fifth? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can we make those two Probably dates? Make make them the same. Make them the same. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So we'll leave this as the 10th and the TA will be the 5th or are we doing vice versa? What's yeah. your thoughts? Let's see what we're looking at next year. You're making me dizzy, Derek. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, so June, uh, June 5th is on a Thursday. Uh, we could go ahead and just move it to the 6th to have it on a Friday. Um, that'd give everybody a whole week after May, basically, to, to get their stuff in line, get their 236s ready and submitted. And, you know, and at that point, uh, trying to remember, see. Now, what did we, didn't we say, right? yeah, yeah, see, we're going to be, we're still having it set up where we could review CT applications if we had the ability to that first meeting in June on the 5th. So um, if we just went to the 6th, then that would give everybody to still, uh, you know, submit any uh, uh, reimbursement uh, payments that we are waiting for for the CT part, plus we can course we still have it on here that we're only going to review those who have the receipts with them uh upon uh for june uh, okay. so uh but yeah we could probably change that to make sense i mean i figure you know if we're if, we're, if by june 5th we're expecting you we're only going to look at your application if you have the receipts provided then it would only make sense by you know by the six we have all of them turned in uh by then because you would have still had a whole month before prior to uh if you ordered something in uh march or in in may uh so and we're in we're approved okay well that All would right. be the ct funds what about the ta i think they yeah i think yeah. it's listed at june 5th i believe
I'm going to pull this over here. Let's see. No, the TA funds under number, under section three, number six. Say June 5th. Yeah, just, well, the following month, the 15th, and then no later than June 5th on the month of ending in May. Just move them both to the 6th? Uh, I don't know how June 5th lines up as far June, as... June 5th would be the day we would have our actual uh, AACSE meeting Okay. for that month. Okay. Move them both to June 6th? Yeah, up to the sixth day after. Okay. okay. Fifteen and ten. So that takes care of any requirements under section three. Okay. Are we were Ready to move with curriculum now? Am I, am I caught up? Yes. All right. Basically, instructors guidelines material for state approved curriculum is 100% covering all costs. Student curriculum is 100% for total students for, or cost for students uh, curriculum. And then the maximum for code books. And that's where we have some proposed changes. And some of these changes was some of them I say it was going to happen because as everybody knows, the modern plumbing was happened last year with a complete uh, buy-in for first through fourth. And now we're only looking at buying uh, for first first year only the curriculum. So well, some of that was going to change anyway. So uh, yes, calls for curriculum should go way down. Looking at plumbing and electrical, what we did last year. So uh, what was proposed would be to strike out code book for second year apprentices. And before we start talking about this, the FY24 will be changed to FY25. Uh, we need to update the uh, MOU uh, for buying uh, plumbing code books. When that was done and the, the cost, I think that's already been done for this, this year. Maybe that was last year. Maybe I need to check on that. I will do that. Okay. That'll be my action item. So all that will be updated on cost and everything. Now, getting back to David's proposed changes. Um, David, did you want to comment on the electric and plumbing? Yes. Uh, basically, everybody, you know, the past couple of years, we've been saying only second year apprentices can get a code book. And I think we're, you know, we could be missing some transfers. Say they come in from out of state uh, in their third year. Well, they just don't get one, What, whatever the situation might be. Uh, I think our goal should be to one time during their apprenticeship, we purchase them a code book. And I don't know if this is the best language for that, but that's the, that's what I was trying to get to in the proposal. And then uh, of course on down there, it says that when you turn in for funding for a code book, that the apprentice's name that it will be assigned to will be listed. And then OSD keeps it in a database. I don't know if that's something that's overburdensome for Derek or OSD or not. So but that's the gist of it. Language may not may need to be a little different, but that's what I was trying to get to. So you're not opposed to what year we give code books. You just want language in there that that covers um, apprentices that's basically coming out of from out of state that gets credit that may give three years credit and they're in a fourth year. Um, classroom but we're not going to provide you a code book because we did that back in second year is that right. what i'm understanding i don't think you should get more than one it's paid for 
during the term of your apprenticeship. But but if you hadn't had one paid for and you need one, we need to buy one. Uh, yes, I agree. I agree. We talked about other, this last week. The mm-hmm. other piece of it, Kelly, is it might tighten up on if you turn in a name with the how many books you're ordering. Uh, <laughs> You know, it, it may tighten up on that some also on extras. Okay. So two two sides to it, but mainly so everybody has opportunity to get one purchase for them if they need it during the term of the apprenticeship. Yeah, I don't, when this language is put in, I don't think it's our intent to not get a person from out of state moving in that goes into a third year class class room not be able to get that person a code book i don't think that was our intent it didn't say that it didn't it's not clear but it doesn't it does not state that but that may be the way we're handling it um okay let me make a note derek is osd tracking uh names and code books at this time we haven't ever done that. Okay. I didn't think, I mean, that's a large task to ask you to keep up with. If <laughs> ever well, apprentice has been granted well, one in the state, I mean, I think the schools can do that to an extent. The transferring around is where it's going to kind of get messy. Yeah. Well, you know, what I would, what my thought would be there, guys, I just make a, a simple, you know, form, you know, that they just, you know, hey, you're asking for 20 books. Okay. Just list out all your 20 apprentices on it. And I'll just take that spreadsheet and then, you know, that gets sent in to me and then I'll take that and I'll just get that combined into one main one. Uh, and then that way, you know, from there, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, take a little bit of time, but it don't, it don't really take that long guys as far as with Excel being able to find my duplicates and all that and, you know, and so forth. So it, it really wouldn't be too big of a deal. Uh, but you know, I agree with David. Uh, you know, if, if we do it this way, this this takes care of us one having to worry about, hey, you're only a second year person or you're third, I can't get you one. A fourth, I can't get you one. You know. So I, I don't I wouldn't have a problem with it. I think that would really make it better all around. And then uh, there's a comment uh uh Kelly in the chat about will the will the book stay with the apprentice of the program if they transfer. I think it to me, it's the apprentices. You're going to make notes in it, put tabs on it, all that. You keep it, but you only get one, whatever happens to it. I agree with that, David. Yeah, I agree. It's it's their book. They they put tabs in it, they mark, they make notes. Uh, definitely, yes. That's what we're that's what we're trying to prevent. Is if we if one program has provided a a book and they transfer to another, yes, they take all that. The other program they're transferring shouldn't be responsible in getting them a book. Uh, you know, we're only buying one book to, to your point. So can yeah. I ask a question? This is Patricia. Um it, what happens if a, an apprentice leaves a program and then comes back after a code cycle change, would they not be eligible for the next code book? Code cycle, yes. Okay. Yes. So we're just talking about just code cycles. Code cycles, curriculum updates, uh, different uh, versions, uh, stuff like that. We they would be eligible. Everybody would be eligible to update their curriculum or code books. But if it's the same book, and same year and everything, yeah, one time only is what we're going to pay for. Um, and. It is coming, yes. Uh, I'll try to put in some language that programs are responsible for um, providing a list of where those books go. Um, we're using state money uh, for this curriculum. It's no different than equipment. What's your requirements for equipment? You purchase it, you have a receipt on it, you list where it's being used. Who is responsible for that? When the state does an audit, they ask me, where's this computer? I want to see this computer. Curriculum should be the same way. We should have documentation. Programs should have documentation of who got the book and when. So it's probably coming. So and probably this year or so. Uh, be thinking about that. What we want to include in that 
the requirements and stuff for where these books are. Uh, we talked years about buying a classroom set and using them in a classroom. Well, some cases that will work. I agree. Other cases it will not. So we still, we, we need to document where these books are. And that would help when we do these transfers of information at hand that I can tell that, you know, John Bain got a book two years ago, a uh, code book two years ago. We've had no code cycle. That person is transferring to a different program in the state. He has a book. He goes to that program and asks, well, I lost my code book. I need a, well, let me take that back. He just states, I need a code book. Well, the state give you one? Oh, uh, I don't remember. I don't know. Well, we can we can find out and doc and it's documented. So Kelly, by uh looking at uh I think uh Patricia's point then that would need to read something a little different where it says one code book per code cycle per student. Yeah, I've I've made some notes. Okay. Uh, code cycles. Um yes. Totally agree. So, um, with uh, with what y'all are proposing, would y'all not agree that our number three point here just needs to be to just be totally taken away then? Because if we're gonna not matter what year it is, then you know, and that's kind of what this number three modern plumbing exception was built for. Oh, number three. Yes, the or the eyes. The sorry, the three eyes there. Uh, so uh, Roman numeral three, uh, for the modern plumbing exception. If we're going to allow them to get it at any time at that point, then we just take all that out. Okay. All right. With let me state this: with us improving our documentation on who has what, do we have any problem of? providing a code book in first year but we've had past discussions well we want them to get we'll say invested in the apprenticeship program before before we provide them a code book before we go to that expense um do we want to give them a, a code book in first year i think modern plumbing i think their curriculum, I think, has a code book. Uh, I believe it's in the curriculum of the modern plumbing. So they kind of need the code book. As far as the other curriculum, they don't really, our, our code is, is not in their curriculum. It's an international type code. What are your thoughts on that? We have such a problem with retention from year one to year two i mean it's just not as strong as we'd like it to be that's my primary concern although you know i, I could see uh I could see a reason um as we draw nearer to the end of year one uh maybe purchasing code books um you know late in the season if you will before year two begins yeah yeah i i would kind of wait until year two starts and see who's back if we're going to do it that way and then provide books. Um, I'd rather them give them a book then than doing it at the end of a semester, in the spring semester, and, you know, they're not going to do nothing with it over the summer, I don't think. Right. So uh, them being able to find it and be available for not a school with uh, code books in hand may be challenging for a few. So I would, um, if we're going to wait, I would do it after we see what the roster looks like uh, at the beginning of second year. Yeah. Kind of like it is now. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of why the language is like it is in the second year. Um, we didn't want to invest in first year students that weren't going to be here but during the, the start of second year. Yep. So, okay. 
that, that, that also, you know, just kind of being trying to be forward thinking here. I know there, there's some verbiage that talks about how funding's available for pre-apprenticeship and, uh, you know, uh, programs that are offered through secondary career centers. I think that protects us from opening up possibly, you know, some unexpected expenditures on code books for, you know, for uh, just anyone, so to speak, rather than your second, you know, beginning with your second year people. Yes. So I think what I'm hearing is that uh, we know it's a concern about uh, providing uh, a code book for first year apprentices, but uh, we want to get those first year apprentices a book in hand uh, where programs can start going over the uh, code book in their curriculum, program curriculum first year and not have to wait the second year. And then also we, we need to update how we uh, track uh, these books, these code books, these curriculum books and all the above. Um, is, that, is that what I'm hearing? think so and I assume we're gonna you know we're gonna go through this then we're gonna come back and hit it again next month with some after it's been thought about a little more and then go from there yeah we will make the the changes that we talked about today and hopefully get you know this the curriculum code books finalized and everything so we have language in there that we can look at in, at our next meeting yes is our intent yes and then we would discuss it in our June meeting, hopefully get a, the document where we think uh, it needs to be. Uh, there'll probably maybe another couple of changes. We can probably make those changes if need to, send them out uh, mid-June, and hopefully be prepared for our July meeting. So that's that's our plan right now. Okay, I will uh, see if we can get though some language uh, wrote up about the code cycles. Uh, take out the second year. We'll start providing. We'll start providing uh, code books and curriculum books uh, when they are fully registered with the program. So we'll put that in there. Um, We'll put some language in there about tracking uh, code books, and the uh, apprentice program's responsibilities for doing such, uh, and how that will be tracked. Uh, what else? Is that about it? Okay. And we probably need we we'll probably, uh, Derek, we need probably need to put, you know, it's got a heading of curriculum. We probably need to put curriculum in code books or something, right not here. just curriculum. Gotcha. So that's, to me, it's two different things. A code book's not a, a curriculum. It's not a teaching book. Okay. All right, anything else over uh, page seven? Um, just thinking, uh, and you might have said it, Cody, or um, Kelly, and I missed it, but uh, uh, as far as this modern plumbing, if we are allowing them to buy just about this whole book being able, you know, the whole purpose of using some of this from what I've heard is you be able to get it and you got it good. For, you're good for four years. Yeah. Uh, so we figure we, at that point, sounds like we should add something similar to, to it about uh, at, along the lines of what David was saying on sending something in on a apprentice name, et cetera, for that list. That way we're not buying them the curriculum multiple yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it'd be for, you know, uh, 
And it would be one, four, one through three of the of the curriculum or code book. Yeah, it would be the same for all. Okay. Yep. Just uh just kind of FYI how we do it at Japan. I don't necessarily know it's right. We get our code books in, we serialize every one of them with a number, old school library book style thing. We've got a, a log and every book is assigned to a student that numbers, you know, serialized inside the front of the books. And that way we know who's been given a book, what date, and what number it was. Um, awesome. And that's how we've been doing it for, for years. Um, we do keep camp books on campus the first uh, several years of school just because it's easier, you know, they, if, if they leave with the book, they never show up with the book. It's in somebody else's truck. I left it at home. <laughs> it's wherever. <laughs> if they're on campus, they have them. Uh, we find that when they get to, you know, third year ish, they're, they're committed in, into it enough that they seem to come to and from school with them. Yeah. Uh, so that's how we've been handling it <laughs> for several years. And, uh, you know, truth be told it just that way it, you know, we, we keep them there. So they, we know they always have them for class. Of course, we're in one facility. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not spread out all over everywhere. So, uh, but we do serialize them uh, just so we know who got what. And it, it, you know, that system seems to work pretty well. I've been doing it for several, several years now. So no, just, great. just a thought, it's you know. Great information. Uh, back a few years ago, uh, we produced a form and every, every time they got a book or something, they the book was listed it was checked and it was what dates they received it so uh, we just keep a track of them that way uh, i know with virtual and all that sometimes it's challenging but uh, there is a mailing tracking number and everything when that person gets the book and everything that's trackable so we know that now so we're used to that so yeah we just need to make sure all programs throughout the state are on board about this and uh, they need to come up, you know, with their own system of how they do it, you know, but this is, would be the information that we would need going forward. So anyway, any other I'll, comments? Well, I'm, I'm all for um, what he was talking about there. If we've got a system of be best practices that are in place, something that's simple, it doesn't have to be comp, it doesn't have to be complicated. It would behoove us to push out a recommended practice, two or three simple steps that they can go through to make it a a um, a common practice across the programs to track that. Just like he's talking about, that's not complicated, and it's an incredible best practice that we could. It doesn't have to be a requirement, but if we made the suggestion, there are a lot of these programs out there that are looking for good ideas. It's easy for him to follow. It dang sure makes Derek's life easier. I second that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, um, you know, just reading the chat, I'm sure, you know, uh, other programs are, are already doing it, so... I don't think it'll be a big change for, for most, or it shouldn't be. Derek, are you thinking um, Are you thinking that we're, and for the group as a whole, uh, we will initially need to take inventory, correct? I mean, essentially provide Derek with a list of, of who currently has uh, what, so to speak. Um, but, but then, uh, Derek, what do you think about a shared or a... Um, a common Excel spreadsheet with the, yeah. with, the with the headings that you're going to need so that you're not getting, you know, so that you're not getting different formats and just yeah. make it easier on you, you know? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, yeah. I mean, if that's what y'all are wanting to do, I would say that wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad idea. You go ahead and just, you send that in, you know, around the, you know, first month of you going into school, you're going to know within that first month who has what. Mm -hmm. uh and then you could go ahead and from there go ahead and send in a sheet saying hey all these already currently have it uh and then i can get those added to the mm -hmm. list and then you know going forward we'll just move the list well, over whenever we get get them in approval yeah we might i don't know there's so much fluctuation month to month we might want to add that to our semester in report or something mm-hmm that way we do it twice a year and it's done. Absolutely. I think that's, that's, 
goes back to that idea of providing guidance on best practices. And if there's somebody that's, you know, some of our group that's got some, a, a really fluid system, it provides Derek the opportunity to make it the same across the board. And, and as mentioned, not getting back random submissions. Uh, he can come up with a, with a real simple name-based, program-based, five or six-digit serial number system that that could be common across all the applications. And, in, and including it in those reports, I think it's an excellent idea. Yeah, no, like, you know, ours, we just, just simply started with a number. If you were going to a state level, you could assign each program a certain param parameter of numbers that they would, you know, start in, you know, and then the, that way, if it's in the book and it's, you know, two, three, four, five, six, and that's assigned to JAPA, even though it goes to someone else's school, they'll still know where that book come from. If you wanted to do it on state level, ours are just simply numbered, you know, and as far as how we received them, you know, over the years when you're getting several, you know, several hundred books over the course of several years, that was the only way we'd come up with keeping track of who had what and where they went, you know. Uh, so an assigned parameter of numbers would work pretty well if you want to track it statewide. I'm not sure we want to track individual books. I think if we provide a book, we need to document it and not put a serial number in a book. And it's how many books do we issue a year, Derek? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's what I'm uh, give saying. me just a second. <laughs> I'm just thinking. What do you want to know? Code books? Well, I mean, I'm just saying if, if you know, I'll know what my number is, but if it goes to Bill Rochelle at ABC, he's not going to know what that, who that's assigned to, you know, so. Is there not a way that would be ubiquitous across what we're trying to attempt, like, and, and I'm going to show my ignorance here, but I would think maybe we could tie it to the individual student's rapids number. That's what I'm thinking. Um, we last year... Uh, 1200 right. code books last year. One of my thoughts is, is that if you want to put a number with it, it might ought to come in with uh, when they submit the name and then that number is put in the system in that sheet because it would be really hard for Derek to issue numbers and then make sure everybody got the numbers back, you know, <laughs> just a thought to make that paperwork less for you, Derek. Uh, well, that's, I, I, I that's, would agree with that. And then also, you know, hey, the Rapids number sounds great, but, you know, what we've already learned now that when transfers happen and so forth like that, sometimes they're going to have a different Rapids number when they go to a different program. I would say at that point, that's not really something to, to utilize. Yeah, I, I mean, programs can track their numbers, code books, curriculum books, however they want. Uh, the end result the state needs, this committee needs is, does John Smith have a code book and curriculum book and when were they issued? That's the only thing we need to know, I believe. Because my thought would be, I'll just get me a spreadsheet. I might have yeah. 40 different yeah. tabs on it, but I'll have one tab, you know, or, you know, something to that effect, have one main one, but then also have it broke out by program. Uh, yeah, just to I make think, it a little easier as well. So yes, I mean, we'll we'll come up with something and yeah. we can discuss later. Uh, I like month. copy and paste. Okay. Yeah, uh, and, and copy and great, paste is nice. Yeah. <laughs> and all great comments uh, appreciated. Keep thinking that way. Uh, look in the chat box. Uh, AJ's made a, a couple of comments. Um, so be thinking about her comments. Um, all right, let's move on down to page eight, I believe. Equipment, yeah, a 20,000 cap. Um, uh, let me just say this as far as what AJ had said about the database, yes. Um, we got a couple of check boxes on there on the additional information section for an apprentice already. One of them says past journeyman exam. The other one just says past test. I could easily just address, have the one modified to past test, have it say provided code book. 
uh, you know, have something like that there uh, where there's just a, a check box at that point. Okay. No, great sure. comment. <laughs> okay. Uh, equipment, uh, $20,000 cap per physical year. You might want to put that in there per year, per physical year. Um, the three quotes, the computer, definition of computer labs, office furniture, hand tools, cost of apprenticeship is considering the approval process per apprentice. And number seven, joint applications. It's we can it's different programs can use this piece of equipment at different locations. It can be transferred to other locations at different times during the semester be used in a, or maybe a lab setting. We encourage to do that. Uh, any comments over equipment? I will say, you know, on this number seven, you know, of course, I've only been here two and a half, you know, close to getting close to three years. I've never seen anybody send in a joint application for equipment. I don't know if that had been done in the past, uh, but um, most of the time it seems like people that are getting the equipment want to keep it for themselves and are not necessarily wanting to get it and let it go all over the place because they want to be able to utilize it for their apprentices whenever they want to, not be worried about it being at a different location or another program. Uh, so I just kind of get your thoughts. I was just thinking, if anything, you know, we, we've already kind of been doing that on our curriculum purchases um, by having, you know, multiple programs going in on one uh, with one lead applicant who would receive the uh, reimbursement and then they would have to distribute it out to the other program. Um, so I don't, you know, may we see what y'all's thoughts were, but I was saying I, I don't ever see this. Uh, well, but Let me jump in there, Kelly. Yep. I mean, I know of one instance that we did it. We we purchased a, uh, and we all have the same curriculum, Fort Smith, Jonesboro, uh, mm. El Dorado, and Little Rock. We have the same curriculum on instrumentation training, and they have a trainer that set up to go with that curriculum, and it was like $36,000. Mm. And at that time, I think the cap was fifteen. Uh, you know, so those four programs went together and purchased it and used up their grant funding. Okay. And and that's what that's the instance I know of that we did several years ago. And then when one gets done with it, you ship it to the next place instead of buying four of them. Yeah. Okay. So now, that's it, the instance that's been done. Yeah, it has been done in the past. Yeah. Uh I know in past uh some programs, different programs met at the same facility and was using a piece of equipment and we were able to furnish, and I can't remember the equipment, but we were able to furnish a piece of equipment at that facility for two different programs to use. So it has been done in the past. It hasn't okay. been done recently, but it it is an option. It is an option that we need to look at if it's possible that we could do that, then we would, you know, definitely, definitely review it. So, Uh, thanks for the comment, David. All right, instructor training. I don't think anything's changed here. And, you know, my, my thought on this, I just wanted to see what y'all's thoughts were. Um, you know, this, you know, kind of like think about what happened this year. We ended up not using anything. This was our, this is, was, a, was my list for this year for train the trainer, nothing. Um, and we end up using all that money for curriculum and other things. Uh, FY23, you know, we did have some there. 29000 went out there. FY22, we had 11000 that okay. went out for train the trainer. Um, you know, so I just, just figured kind of throw that out there as far as, you know, is this something that we even want to continue? You know, U.S. Department of Labor only requires only ask that somebody provide a instructor training either right at the beginning of what, before they start teaching or hopefully soon after, but just a one-time thing. They don't have it set up as a, 
a, a reoccurring thing uh, as we do here. Not to say it's not 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 a bad practice at all. Uh, keeping your uh, in, instructors up to date, uh, but uh, you know if it's you know I just figured throw it out there, see what you thought. You know, do we want to even have that money set aside there? Hey, Sorry, Jerry, John. This, this, that's okay. This is John. I just wanted to chime in on that real quick. Is that uh, that that uh, you're you're correct in the process, but uh, periodically when we do come out and do a program review, we we may very well ask for. Uh, documentation to show the currency of an instructor. So have they, mm -hmm. have they gotten their, you know, re, a refresher or recertification as an instructor, you know, every couple of years, right? So you do want to keep up with that, but mm -hmm. uh, right. Pro pro providing it directly is a one-time thing up front when they become an instructor, but uh, we do expect sponsors to keep up with that documentation on their own uh, periodically, because we will ask for it at future reviews. Now, John, um, like for electricians here in the state of Arkansas, for example, uh, we're required to do uh, continuing education. Uh, those individuals are already required to do code updates and so forth, uh, you know, every at least eight hours every three years. Uh, so would something like that suffice for a uh, teacher that was teaching an electrical course? Uh, it, it does as far as their subject matter expertise. Right. And their, their qualifications to continue to be an instructor. But the um, what what DOL also looks at is have they been through a an instructor training course or a train the trainer type course where they understand, regardless of the subject matter, right, whether it's electrical plumbing or whatever the subject is, it's basket weaving. Do they understand how to teach and how adults learn and the, the process of guiding through whatever the curriculum subject might be. So those are two separate things, but they do have to have both. So they want to have subject matter uh, bona fides so that they, they maintaining, if they're doing their CE, that's great. And they're maintaining their license with the state that makes them a subject matter expert, but we also want them to be maintain their qualifications and, and kind of keep up to date with instructor qualifications and learning, uh, you know, the ability and the knowledge on how to teach. And, but that that's that can be easily met it, if there are some courses <laughs> that are part of the um, uh, continuing ed or if the continuing ed providers or the sources also have a an instructor uh, refresher course that, that talks about this is how you teach this subject matter to uh, apprentices or just excuse me the students then that would you know that would work. But 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 there are two separate things. We want to make sure we got something that addresses both sides of that. And you could also get through the community college system and do a train the trainer course, right? A 40 right. hour, 40 hour course every two or three years, uh, whatever, however long the uh, college kind of recognizes that uh, uh, that material is being uh, valuable and creditable. If it expires, you know, or, or a certain period of time you know, then we can work on that. But it doesn't have to be every year. It could be every two years, every three years, four years, depending on, you know, what the material and the licensing requires. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, I think we need to keep it, Derek. Uh, yep. I think maybe this will be our catch-up year on uh, everything, uh, getting our uh, instructors trained. Uh, do we have a training provider list that we provide to the programs? Well, you know, we that's the thing. No. We, we've never done that. Um, okay. You know, we, we kind of talked about it a little bit last year, um, but we never, never really done it because really at the time, the only person when we kind of talked about it, the only person that was even doing it was Don Alliance. Um, you know, as far as actually going out and doing the training. Um, I know uh, ACF had done some you know, in-house stuff because of them being certified trainers and so forth, uh, you know, Kathy and them, uh, as far as teaching their instructors, I know we've funded that before in the past, uh, for that. So, um, but Maybe. it did, I don't think yeah. it was one of those things that she was wanting to just go out and definitely wasn't wanting to go and do it everywhere. I don't think, I think it was just for their own, just for their own instructors. So, um, you know, right now I know, uh, you know, NATF had utilized, uh, Don Hamby, um, 
who used to work here at Office of Skills Development and retired here uh, a couple of years ago now, somewhere like that. So um, I know they had utilized her in the past uh, for that. So, um, you know, that's, as far as I know, Donna, is, I have not heard anything from her on, hey, I'm wanting to get back into doing this. So um, just kind of dropped off the map after she left us. I know David in years past has done some training the trainer, I think, with his group, I believe. So, okay. Yeah, we, we do ours through the electrical training alliance as needed to, to do the refreshers, but, uh, you know, it just must have been the last couple of years not needed because we hadn't had any new instructors or, or they were up to date or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, more to come on that. Okay. Good conversation. Uh, any other comments on instructor training? And then looking at, at outreach and education, uh, we've kind of listed, I think a change that we put in last year was for uh, getting out in front of public, setting up booths, uh, job fairs, being able to cover some of those costs for uh, friendship programs to do that. I like guess listed in one, and then other things that we have um, funded in years past is also listed there. Uh, but we need to somewhat get back to outreach and education a little bit, invest some of our money uh, into that. Um, I know 10 years ago it was hot and heavy. David will. Um, remember this that we were going to Camp Couchdale in, in Hot Springs, feeding FFA uh, students, trying to get the word out, meeting with uh, high school counselors. Uh, we had a probably a five year push that, that we were really trying to promote uh, apprenticeship. So I think some of it has taken off, some of it, other. Other areas have picked up that that ball and ran with it. So we kind of need to relook at where we want to maybe invest some time and money into for this coming year. Any questions, <clears throat> questions or comments about outreach and education? Well, you know, I'm sure we probably would have had some of those grants get submitted this year if we wouldn't have already ran out of money as quick as we did. Uh, you know yeah so um but uh, i think that's also to me it, it's it was a plus as far as i felt like our programs finally were when they had the information they had the documentation had the proof of payment when they had all that information they were getting us they were getting it submitted instead of hanging on to it till the, almost the end of the year uh, yeah. so i think that was you know one of the big things that we saw this year is we had so many of them uh, send that stuff in earlier where used to, we might not see it till, you know, April or May, uh, before we actually saw it, even though they probably could have submitted it back in October. So, uh, that was, that was a big change. So, uh, you know, I, of course. I do have a question on that mm -hmm. where, it, where it says each organization is eligible. Is that, uh, for example, like, uh, you know, we're I'm, we're we're all JTC our programs in Fort Smith, El Dorado, Little Rock, and Jonesboro. So, so does that mean since they're all under the Electrical Training Alliance JTC, that's one organization, or is that or is that supposed to say each program? What's the intent on that? Like, say ACF has several locations. Is that and they're different program? Is that ACF wide is eligible for a thousand or or a thousand per program. I've got a I've got an opinion, David. Uh, just for that matter, if to take take it for what it's worth, I, I think considering you know different site mm -hmm. locations as approved as a you know as a location to provide instruction, and, and also considering how little funds we're using for outreach. Um, I, I would be in favor of opening that up to different site locations. Uh, that may be underneath a single umbrella. Although, I, I mean, I think it's worth discussion. It may not, I don't know what that opens us up to. How much money have we spent on that this past year, Derek? 
Uh, I don't think much of nothing. Yeah. Well, just consider mm -hmm. this. Uh, we need we need to address this, and we need to also address it in equipment so the same language is there. Yeah, I uh, would. I, that's that's a good that's a good point, uh, Mr. Sharp. And, and I and my comments are directly related to outreach because I think that that would be region specific. There, you know, there's activities that would go on on one side of the state compared to in Jonesboro, you know. To what David has told us about equipment and his organization, his program used equipment funding in different locations. They were that way they were able to go over the fifteen thousand dollar threshold and spend thirty six thousand dollars. I know back in the day it was considered location. Yeah. Uh, or he wouldn't been able to do that. You know, and like with what he is talking about there, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, when I, you know, look at rapids or anything, I would see Fort Smith JTC, Fort Smith El Dorado, et cetera. You know, those are separate, separate entities as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, uh, so, I mean, that's, that's how I would look at it too. Uh, you know, that being, being those being separate, cause you know, when I go to Rapids, I got a program name for each one of them. They're not just one group, you know, and, you know, kind of like one main one. And we got different class locations around the state. These are four separate individual programs, according to U.S. Department of Labor. And they've got, you know, their <laughs> committees different. That whole, they're, they are totally separate. That's why I, was <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know how all the other ones that have multiple locations are set up, but I, I just need a little clarification. Oh, well, yeah. Let, so allow me to clarify too. I, I wasn't, I was meaning along the lines of how your structure is set up, David, about being separate entities, not, not necessarily. I have one location here and maybe another one on the, you know, 10 miles away. I, I don't necessarily mean that if it's a separate end, you know, if you, if it's set up as separate entities and as reported to Derek, that's, that's what I was thinking of. Good point, Zach. Good point. Yep. But we, but consider we have the same same language in equipment. So, yeah, and organization. Uh -huh. So it sounds like the easy to kind of get it back to what we're talking about here. It looks like we would just change or an organization to put a program a apprenticeship program something you know, and that would get it to where it's you know as we're talking about jtc's or we got there's i mean talk about that we got i got pipe fitters as well uh you know jet union uh program as well here in the state that we fund uh, and they got different different locations around the state now they're all they're still all together as compared to uh the electrical ones being totally separate uh programs hmm. okay, let's, let's think about that a little yeah. bit mm -hmm. let's uh kind of digest what we've talked about in the comments and stuff and see what we can come up with if we need to change it okay good point all right um uh, anything else over outreach and education if not we're at the bottom page nine uh, section four the last section, uh, worksheets, documentation. Well, I don't believe we need to update any information there, right? Nope. Okay. Um, All right. One, one thing I will bring up, something y'all just think about. Uh, between here and uh, next meeting. Uh, just figured I'd throw this out here. Um, you know, we're always all about getting ECT grants uh, in, reviewed, paid out to the programs as quickly as possible. Uh, and, you know, we, we know they're usually needing these funds. Something to think about. How would y'all feel if somebody submits a CT grant, if what they... Um, what they request and what I would typically would approve if it is the same thing 
would y'all be okay with me going ahead and getting that done? And then providing y'all a list uh, at the meeting. If it's something different, then we would review it and that would be one we would review during our monthly meetings. Just something to think about. Uh, so did you CT funds? Yes, yeah, just you know, just talking about the CT grant. Somebody sends in a CT grant. If what I would recommend and what they are requesting are the same thing, then we would just go ahead and process it, get them the letter, check, whatever, get it out the door. Uh, instead of having to wait till the next month, or uh, and then if it's something different, then we would, you know, of course, bring those to y'all for uh, for further review, so y'all can make a decision. Uh, on how we wanted to expend the funds as they were different uh, and then still be providing a monthly list to y'all of what, what had been approved. Uh, even can provide you the CT applications just like we normally do. Uh, but just if, if everything's already good to go, uh, uh, which we all know most of the time, if they're in those situations, I would say probably 9.9% out, 9 .9 out of 10, uh, we're, we're just going to, approve it and go on uh, where I could possibly get it out to them, you know, the second week of the month instead of having to wait to the, till the very end of the month and us finally review it and then get it out. I think it don't it require a vote. I think, I think my first blush would be no, and needs to go through the committee for approval. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what we're charged with doing and not um, rubber stamping something after the fact. Like I said, just just wanted to throw that out there, let y'all think about it. Uh, okay. So, uh, of course, you know those CT rules are out there. Uh, they are lined up totally different than what we do anyway. <laughs> so, because uh, they they were written back in 1999, so and have never been looked at or reviewed since I've been here. Uh, so, and no telling how long before then. So, and kind of getting into what Kelly was saying earlier, you start diving into those guys, we get, there's all kinds of little requirements that have not been uh, addressed over the years. So, uh, just something to think about. I just, looking at it before, it looked like, hey, if y'all were open to giving that authority over as far as, you know, approving the ones that were already meeting up, then I feel like we could probably be okay. Uh, we could definitely check on it, but Something for y'all to think about between now and next meeting. Okay. Doesn't matter to me either way. All right. I can't ever recall going against one that met the that was that matched in the three years I've been on it. You know, if it if the request lines up and it's approved and it and you approved it, I don't know if we've ever changed one that was that lined up. We've only looked at ones that were different. Hmm. It would free up time to do other things, you know, on yeah. some of the months. There's a lot of CT stuff, you know, there's 30 or 40 to go through and a half of them or half or more are the requested amount and recommended amounts the same. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it would free up time for other things. My, my first thought is you're, you're subject to legislative audit, Derek. So it's, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I know that the committee has, you know, has authority to to reject something, but obviously, if, if we were to reject it, it would need to be with just cause, right? I mean, we would have to provide some sort of rationale, uh, or would need to, anyways. Um, I, I think if we were, to, you know, I think what you proposed is something that we can consider for uh, for discussion, maybe at next meeting too. But if we were to do something like that, I, I, there would need to be some defined guidelines on, you know, what would constitute something for you to bring it to the board um, before the commission. Uh, or, and, you know, as a part of that, I don't know, you know, it's something where we might consider a threshold, you know, you can take a look at whether it be an average or something. And, you know, if it falls below a certain amount uh, that, that would, that might be a, that might not require full approval uh, of the commission. I don't, j just some thoughts. No, good points. Good points. All right, let's let's move up to or back up to agenda item number two. Mr. John, are you still on? He's there. Can you hear us, John? 
Sorry, guys, I was trying to get off of you. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. Uh, do you have, um, uh, well, first, would you please introduce yourself and your kind of your background and everything? I know uh, some of us have met you and everything, but if you would kind of introduce yourself to the board and the awesome. visitors. Yes, sir. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that, sir. Uh, uh, so my uh, sincere welcome uh, and hello to everybody. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, I am uh, the new state uh, Depar uh, Department of Labor uh, State Director for uh, Arkansas um, and just took over effective the 8th of April, this official date. Um, and so I'm, I'm still in a transition between uh, Dallas offices and, uh, and Little Rock offices, um, uh, and that may be for extended period of time. Uh, I've spent the last eight years uh, as an apprenticeship uh, training representative and ATR uh, in Texas. Uh, I have um, and I've uh, accomplished a lot of things, had some, uh, a number of first in the state uh, and, and a first in the nation programs uh, for healthcare, teaching and all that. So I bring, I've got uh, plenty of experience in the apprenticeship world. Prior to that, I, was, I spent two years in the ETA regional office uh, here in Dallas uh, that works with all the state workforce systems in uh, region four or 11 state region. I was a project officer, uh, I'm a federal project officer and uh, uh, grant, you know, managed grants uh, for labor market information, uh, information systems and longitudinal data systems. We did performance reporting. So I understand how the workforce system works as far as their report cards go and what the DOL, the ETA is looking for. Uh, prior to that, I spent five and a half years as the business services manager on the uh, on the Dallas County Workforce Board staff, running business services for 67,000 employers in Dallas County. Uh, and prior to that, uh, started my career, my workforce career over in Fort Worth as a business representative in one of the workforce centers. So I worked all the way up the chain and, and got, you know, 15 plus years of workforce experience under my belt. So I know workforce, uh, understand workforce. I definitely mm -hmm. know business services. Uh, and I and now I've spent the last eight years plus in apprenticeship. So I'm excited to be on board and look forward to working with all the different partners, uh, both program sponsors and, um, and uh, uh, formal agency partners uh, within the state, uh, right? It's certainly OSD, uh, OA, and, and uh, 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 workforce, the workforce side of the house. Uh, but I also look forward to working with all the education and training providers because they really, this program really revolves around them as well. Uh, they're core to what we do. So employers are always number one, those folks that provide jobs. But uh, then number two is is the training providers because that's uh, that's how the, the knowledge gets uh, uh, passed on and, and, and validated, right? Make sure we get uh, valid curriculum. So look forward to working with each and every one of you. It'll, it, it'll take me, you know, several months here to do this uh, and to get around to meet everyone, talk to you, uh, talk about your programs, you know, set up uh, communication to do some initial program reviews. Uh, and, and again, those aren't uh, those are not compliance or audits uh, per se. Those are designed to be technical assistance in nature. And and want you guys to understand that's the way I approach it. Right. I'm not here to, to you know, come up with any gotchas. Uh, those will happen all on their own. And uh, if there's something not quite right. We'll, we'll dig it up uh, sooner, you know, sooner rather than later. And uh, it'll come up. But, you know, I, I assume everybody's doing things the right way from the start and give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And, uh, uh, you know, until something else proves otherwise. So um, we we'll look forward to getting to know all your programs, getting things updated with you uh, and, and working closely to grow apprenticeship uh, all across Arkansas in, in all the different uh, industry sectors uh, where we, we, we may or may not have some traction now, but we certainly can expand into. So thank you. Thank you for your time. I enjoyed listening and hearing all the conversation, the input. Uh, Derek did a great job of, of leading this effort and as, uh, along with Kelly and appreciate you guys' leadership in all this. And I look forward to, to like I say, eventually meeting each and every one of you and working closely with you on making sure your program is doing for you what you need it to do. Uh, 
um, you know, within the within the parameters of DOL uh, apprenticeship. Thank you, John. Yes, thanks, John. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Uh, look forward, forward to that opportunity in the future. So welcome aboard. And uh, Derek, we do have the contact information <coughs> for John out there and everything, I believe. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else, John? Uh, no, sir. Again, just appreciate being a part of the group. I'll, in, you know, in future, I know you guys, you guys got a lot of detail you go through and not all of it, you know, requires uh, my input, uh, you know, or uh, so I'll, I'll occasionally pop in and, and join the meetings where I can, but um, I've got a pretty full plate and, and uh, I alluded to it earlier, but uh, the part of the deal was with this promotion to the Arkansas state director job is I still had to carry uh, my uh, currently assigned Texas programs. So I've got a foot in each state, if you will. <laughs> and uh, and uh, oddly enough, uh, you, you, you know, no, just a coincidence, but I was all, uh, the number of programs I was already handling uh, was just about equal to what's going on in the state. So I already had about 125 programs and uh, about, about 8,500 to 9,000 apprentices. Now that is uh, more than doubled, and now I'm at 280 programs and 18,000 plus apprentices. So my workload just doubled, and there's no uh, help in sight uh, for at least several months until DOL uh, decides to hire some backfields. We had two two positions vacant, and now with my job, it's three. So we're we're extremely shorthanded. Uh, so uh, if you all will bear with me during this transition may take, uh, you know, through the rest of this fiscal year into, you know, October before budgets get straightened out and uh, people get hired uh, and I'm, you know, able to full, full time focus uh, just on Arkansas. But uh, um, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, even though I said that, don't hesitate to reach out. That's not an excuse. If it's something I need, something I need to know about or something that you're having an issue with, uh, you know, feel free to reach out and we'll get we'll get it figured out somehow. In fact, there's. There's a lot of smart folks in this uh, call right now that can that can usually come up with a lot of the answers as well. So we utilize everybody on the team. Thank you. Hey John, hey John. That that's kind of uh, about where my journeyman would tell me to tighten up. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. I was always told, hey, there's no rest for the wicked, and the righteous <laughs> don't need it. So whichever whichever side of that you fall on, it's just no. There's no rest, so. <laughs> yeah, John, I understand, you know, everybody's time's uh, valuable. Uh, we did have you listed as agenda item number two. So if you had to give your report and leave, that was fine. So I apologize not seeing that you were on the meeting when I started the funding guidelines update. So, but yes, you will be put at the front, front of our list. So if you have to bow out, we totally understand. All right, uh, item number five, uh, remember our June meeting is in person at OSD. Uh, I think the only thing we need to finalize is who is going to provide food, lunch, if we want to do that option. And it will be a uh, virtual and in-person option. I'll meeting. check Kelly. I'm sure it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Um, me. Uh, Derek, uh, Kelly. Yeah. yeah, I mentioned last time we were in person that we I we'll take care of this one. Okay. Up. Awesome. Uh I guess the best way is Sarah here. I could she can order if you tell her what we want, the amount we want, and get it I'll get it all paid for. So we can yeah, talk um, about that before. So Yeah, I'll get I'll get I'll get with you, Tracy. And we'll, we'll work deal. something out because I can, you know, send a poll out to everybody like we have been doing and find out what we got and then and get that information sent over to you. Let's get it delivered like you had that other. So, OK. OK. All right. So remember that that's June 6th. Um, 
just FYI, Timberly, put this in your calendar. Uh, by the program training um, training dates looks like it'll be the third week in July. So this kind of Timberly set that. It's usually set for a, I think a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Usually, it's usually a midweek or midday midweek type deal. Yeah, so I will. I'm going to try to figure that out here within before we meet again uh and get that set up so yeah yeah this is just fyi so you can kind of pencil it in uh, derek will work on a uh, a date and give it to us uh i'm still working on membership training board member training state training for the group um uh, and also i sit on a, a few other committees I think I was out of the room because I don't remember raising my hand. But anyway, <laughs> I sat on a few other committees, one being the State Rehabilitation Council. And they have a lot of uh, programs, have a lot of free stuff uh, that we could offer to some of our friends plumbers. The same way with adult education. Uh, there's... You know, courses out there that are free, classes, English as a second language, math, reading, uh, developing those skills. Um, and I'm looking or thinking about, I know most programs have some type of registration packet they send out their apprentice. But if we could come up with a one pager, uh, would you be interested in maybe plugging this information either a mail or electronic version uh, into that registration form. So the it gets out to the apprentice, the employer. They see these these opportunities that are offered by the state or offered free. Uh, would you be opposed to doing that kind of in your registration packet? I mean, this would be this this free. be the this be the registration packet that the program would be providing to the apprentice, correct? Yes. When they yes. Okay. when they sign up every year, I assume each program has their kind of own registration packet that they use to. <laughs> to uh, I know you do for new apprentices, but I assume uh, second through fourth apprentices, you you have a registration packet that you send out for them to get signed up. This would be part of that. If I could provide that information. We could provide that information to the French programs through it, throughout the state. Would you use it? I guess is my question. I think there'd definitely be some that used it if they had it, knew it was out there. And I I saw a report um, probably six months ago that they listed two people that took advantage of some of the services that were offered. And I'm thinking, I mean, two people, really? How many electrical and plumbing apprentices do we have in the state right now? Out of that number, we've, we've, we've only contacted or they're getting two people using their free services. So that number just blew my mind. So from that point, I've been trying to figure out how can we get this information out to our apprentices, our employers? Uh, are they having a language barrier with the people they're trying to hire? Uh, do they have problems with their apprentice reading? Does the training provider have problems with apprentices reading and interpreting prints and stuff like that, math skills? I mean, I mean, these are free courses that are, you know, free throughout the state at different locations that they can go and better themselves. So I'm looking at trying to put a probably a one pager together per per program that we could try to get out to the just the information stuff that, hey, this is out there. Please use it if you need it. So. Just looking for comments from uh, the board members and, and the guests. It's online. Kelly, I think yes. that is excellent because I think the problem is they just don't know that it's available. And yeah. uh, it can also encourage 
individuals who might struggle with reading, that uh, there is help for them and that they can be a part of these programs. And I, I think they have skills a lot of times and maybe their reading's not there, but they're very good workers. And so I think that's very important. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, uh, and that's a good point. Uh, you know, I need to get out to our instructors if we are having uh, apprentices that are struggling in certain subjects and stuff. Uh, what's out there that can help this apprentice? What can help, help this apprentice uh, complete their apprenticeship, complete their uh, journeyman test, you know, certification test, whatever it is at the end of their apprenticeship. You know, we're we're trying to push out good employees uh, in a timely manner. Uh, so, so the, the state, if they have a, a reading challenge, I'll say, um, they will provide a interpreter uh, for some of the tests. I know they do that for the plumbing or they used to. So, but anyway, I will continue working on that and trying to come up with something. And as I get it, I will share it with the group. Um, hey, I was um, Kelly, we do to... have a reply from Crystal, Little Rock JTC. She said she'd like to have the re, uh, have resources to send or give to applicants that would help them with their math skills. It would help them pass their aptitude test. Great. Great point. Yes, that's what we're looking for. Now, you know, uh, something like that, Kelly, you could always get me before the training and I can get that put in the, the booklet. Uh, okay. And we, goal, we, we could discuss that kind of like we did the veteran stuff the last couple of years. Yes. Uh, we could, you know, bring that up this time uh, during the training. Okay. Uh, yeah, my goal is to have this information and we can use it in next fiscal year. So that means okay. that's my deadline of July 1st. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. All right. Good information. Um, that's all I need to cover. Uh, open discussion. Any other topics from the members that we need to discuss? From anybody that is a visitor that's online, any 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 comments? All right. Well, hearing none, uh, we've had a meeting over two hours, which is not really common. So I appreciate everybody's time. Everybody's time is valuable, I know. And remember, our, our next meeting will be June 6th. Uh, we'll try to have these updates. I think Derek will try to have them done. And correct me if I'm wrong, we'll try to have, get them done. And we'll try to get them out uh, a week or maybe two weeks before our next meeting. So you'll have them in hand to review so you're ready to review <laughs> it our next meeting. That's my plan anyway. Uh, so, Kelly, I, I've already, the one we were working on updates on, as everybody was watching, I've already sent that to everybody so they can have it and play with it, oh, whatever they want to do yeah. there. So Yeah, I know she was making notes. That's great. Yep. All right. Well, hearing no other business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We adjourn. Yeah.